Hello everybody and welcome back to my book club. So today I'm going to be giving an in-depth discussion on a book that is going to be turned into a Netflix film very soon. I actually think that they're done filming. I'm going to be doing an analysis on the book I'm Thinking of Ending Things by Ian Reid. This analysis will contain spoilers from start to finish. If you have not read this book, do not watch this video. I have 10 pages of notes. So forgive me if for a lot of this video I don't look at the camera because there's no way I can even begin to talk about this book without having my guide over here. I'm looking at my notes right now and it's a lot. So apologies in advance if I am awkward, but hey, thanks for choosing to hang out with me today. So I originally gave this book four stars, but after much deliberation, particularly as I was starting to write the script, I have now raised this book to five stars. Um, it is incredible. It reads like a David Lynch film. It's very evocative of films like Mulholland Drive. Uh, like David Lynch's films, it demands your sweet, sweet attention. Oh, look at the bird chirping. So if you are listening to the audiobook, you can't be doing other things. I mean, like, if you're doing other things like cooking or cleaning or doing the laundry like what I do, then uh, try to divide your attention such that you don't ignore what's being said because a lot of this book is context upon context upon context. Take notes because by the end you will be lost. I took notes after like every three sentences and my note page was an entire screenplay treatment. So yeah, I have been kind of obsessed with this book in very unhealthy ways, <laughs> but you know, I am gonna be using this video to express myself and what I think happened in I'm Thinking of Ending Things by Ian Reid. So what Ian Reid accomplishes here is pretty miraculous. It's no surprise that Charlie Kaufman wants to direct a film of it, but I would have personally had David Lynch do it. Um, so to put things into perspective, I'm going to run down all the events of the book, and then we are going to break it down. All right, so the book has four central characters. You have Jake, his unnamed girlfriend, and his two parents. So the story follows Jake and his girlfriend on a road trip on the way to his parents' house to the barn where he was raised as a child. And a huge bulk of the story takes place from the girlfriend's point of view. So through the road trip, they have many conversations on the dark wintry road on the way to visit the barn. And eventually they get to the farmhouse. His parents act in very peculiar ways. Something is definitely off. There's a creepy basement, a bathroom with only a single pill bottle, and a very scary painting. The whole time that they are on this trip, the girlfriend argues with herself because she wants to break up the relationship. She says that she's thinking of ending things. And she knows their relationship isn't going to work. So they get to the parents' house, they have dinner, and when dinner ends, they make their way back home. One thing leads to another, and they find themselves in the parking spot of an abandoned school. Once they're at the school, they begin to make out in the car, and Jake witnesses a man watching them from inside the school. Jake then proceeds to chase the man. I'm sorry if there is noise outside. So feeling alone and scared, the girlfriend runs in after him, and she gets lost in the maze-like structure of the school. The big reveal is that Jake and his girlfriend are the same person and everything we've been seeing has taken place in Jake's head. The book ends with Jake's dead body being found. So it is revealed that he has committed suicide and everything we have just read is a metaphor for the contemplations of a person who is considering ending their own life. Uh, to analyze this book, we must turn to Freud's model of the psyche. So his framework is comprised of three things. So the first one is the Eid, which is the primitive and instinctual part of the mind. You know, the feelings, the emotions, the instincts, what you derive pleasure from and things like that. The second one is the superego, which operates as a moral conscience. And the third one is the ego, which is the component of personality that is reasonable for dealing with reality. So I'm going to run this story down into three parts. We're going to divide this story into the people finding the body of Jake, uh, what led up to their relationship, what led up to the decision to go on the road to meet the parents and think of ending things. And then the third part will be the actual road trip to the parents' house when he genuinely thinks of ending things. So first one is the ego. This is the reality. The people who have found his dead body and are assessing the situation objectively. First, we learn that something awful has happened. Several observers are shocked. More people gather and share how they perceived Jake when he was alive. They said that he was not a rational person, and someone says, he's not like us. So we learned that upon discovering the body at the school, some rooms were vandalized and there were chains on the door. So there was graffiti everywhere, and the graffiti read, there's only one question we need to resolve. Okay, so we learned that the body was found scrunched up in the closet with self-inflicted pressure wounds 
on the neck. The people who hired him apparently knew that he was smart and well-read. Um, his previous job involved academic work for, you know, on the PhD level, and he was not married and he was living entirely alone. This is very emphasized. So throughout the time Jake worked there in the school, he had become non-verbal. It is said that they regret hiring him. The people who find his body say that they regret hiring him. Apparently, he had been known for spending lots of time writing in his notebooks. It is revealed that he had been working at the school for 30 plus years, so nearly three decades. He lived in his parents' farmhouse and he was known to be gentle, but he couldn't talk to people. He was not interested in socializing. He had tinnitus and was lactose intolerant, and he did not like being in the boiler room of the school. He was so smart, but he did not want to interact with other people. They find his diary, which is near his dead body, and supposedly it contains a story. A story so convoluted that no one can decipher it. The story supposedly explains why he has chosen to kill himself. And the novel I'm thinking of ending things ends with the reader being asked to start at the end and circle back to find out why he killed himself. So that's exactly what we're going to do. So I really hope you're still with me. <laughs> Thank you for hanging out with me, I mean it. So now we are going to analyze Jake's Eid. So this is his primal and instinctive feelings. These are seen in the flashbacks. So the events that lead up to the drive to the farmhouse and how Jake and his girlfriend met and the things that they've gone through. So they're on the drive on the way to the farmhouse, and while they're on the drive, they're, the girlfriend is having flashbacks. The whole book takes place from the point of view of the girlfriend, and it is only later on that we realize that the girlfriend and Jake are the same person. So from now on, just assume that I'm talking from the point of view of the girlfriend, unless specified otherwise. All right? So the beginning of the relationship starts when girlfriend meets Jake on trivia night. She is instantly drawn to and fascinated by his intellect. The girlfriend starts receiving cryptic and anonymous calls. She mentions that the caller is a middle-aged man with a feminized voice. So this clearly, now that we know everything, indicates that she and him are the same person. This makes more sense when you factor in the fact that the call to her were being made from her own number. So the caller never wants to talk, he only leaves voicemail which says, there's only one question to resolve, I'm not lucid. The assumptions are right, I can feel my fear growing, now is the time for the answer. Just one question, one question to answer. I know what you look like, I know your feet, I know your hands and skin and head and hair and heart, and you shouldn't bite your nails. So we learn that girlfriend is attracted to Jake's shyness and dependency. He is extremely smart and enjoys chatting. Uh, this to me is how he sees himself, and this is how he wishes other people on the outside would see him. So the girlfriend recalls a memory from her childhood, a menacing man outside her window that scares her. This is a metaphor for anxiety at a young age, in my opinion. So Ian Reid leaves this somewhat open, perhaps to superimpose your own anxieties, since when we read art or novels or literature, we take the sum total of our experiences into our perception, into how we experience it and read the art and consume it. So she says that the man waved to her in such a way that indicated that she will never be alone again. So this is like anxiety and depression. It takes over every single part of your life and it never really goes away. You kind of just have to cope with it or find ways to cope with it, find some coping mechanisms and whatnot. So she recalls the time that she had a headache and Jake brought the, her some Advil. She let him bring it up first, and he apparently wrapped the pills up, which is a mere inconsequential gesture, but one that she was very aware of. Since Jake is both himself and the girlfriend, this scene conveys that he is simultaneously doesn't care, yet is very self-conscious, which means that as a person, he has no balance. It is said most times that balance can be found between chaos and control. So Jake, having chosen to end his life, is all chaos. Thus, he has lost all control. So Jake laments that getting to know someone is like putting a never-ending puzzle together. We fit the smallest pieces first, and then we get to know ourselves better in the process. So Jake is struggling to find a distinct identity. He no longer knows who he is. Okay, and this leads us to the superego. The deep and underlying motivations. Him rationalizing whether he should commit suicide. The ego takes place after the suicide, when people are objectively observing him and who he was as a person. The Eid lays the groundwork for why he committed suicide, you know, his emotions and early childhood trauma and whatnot. And the superego is when he, as the title says, is thinking of ending things. And this is going to be the longest part, but I think this is where the chunk of the book is. I think this is the book's backbone 
And this is the strongest, most scary part of the book because the fear is not an indicator of fear. It's not serial killers or ghosts or creepy dolls. The fear is something very human and at times quite universal. Okay, so super ego, morals, good and bad. This is when he is concerned with the goodness and the badness of his actions and he's weighing his options as to whether or not he should indeed end things. Okay, so the book opens up with the recurring notion that you cannot fake a thought. This is when we learn that his girlfriend is considering breaking up with Jake. Or to put it in the context of the story, we learn that Jake is seriously considering committing suicide. So the journey to the barn to salvage any sense of joy or meaning from his past or potential future is the decision-making process of Jake. Consider the setting. It's dark, it's cold, it's desolate, it's snowy, and the drive up to the barn has no headlights because there is no light or joy in his life. So during the road trip, she justifies and rationalizes with herself why she should and shouldn't be with Jake. She says that she's attracted to his quirkiness and stability and ensuring a future with him because of his good career. She says she likes his career choice, he's gonna be a professor, but something with him is just not right. Okay, so the biggest irony is that all her doubts about the relationship are to do with him, yet he is the one person she doesn't want to express these doubts to. So on the road trip, they discuss some concepts, and I'm gonna be dividing these concepts into three parts. So you have the discourse of the self, the discourse on existentialism, and the discourse on despair. The discourse of the self starts with a conversation on the concept of dark matter, because Jake is a scientist. So dark matter is composed of particles that do not absorb, reflect, or emit light, which means they cannot be detected by observing electromagnetic radiation. Stay with me. Dark matter is material that cannot be seen directly. We know that dark matter exists because of the effect it has on objects that we can observe directly. So what is the object that we can observe directly in the context of this story? It is Jake. Like the dark icy road that he is traveling on, all he has is sadness and darkness. His condition has resulted in his inability to absorb light, which is happiness derived from life or other people. Man is a rational and social being. You cannot be one without the other. We need other people to stay sane and to learn about ourselves and about the world. You can't be the best kisser in the world without having another partner to kiss, basically. Next is the discourse on existentialism. So this is the story she tells about her driving instructor. Um, existentialism is the philosophy that emphasizes individual existence, freedom, and choice. It is a view that humans define their own meaning in life and try to make rational decisions despite existing in an irrational universe. So in this story, uh, she talks about how she and her driving instructor were sitting in an unmoving car and chatting. She continues to be a curious observer and notices that his hands are those of an artist. So the driving instructor then hands her a candy which has words printed on the wrapper. He says, puzzles are things that we have to solve on our rainy days. He also admits that he gets fulfillment by analyzing and meeting people he chats with, particularly with the discussions he has with the student drivers that he trains. So what does this symbolize? It seems to suggest that the driving instructor is a memory from his childhood. It is a facet of his personality that his condition suppressed the older he got. This aspect of his personhood being the one that allowed him to permit himself to seek human interaction, which was stifled when his depression and anxiety completely took over his life. So as people, we notice that we are alive because we are conscious. Consciousness of the self can be healthy or unhealthy. If you achieve balance, it's healthy. But people with no path in life have the tendency to either be overly self-conscious or completely apathetic to life and those around them. The character of Jake seems to struggle between both extremes. He can't find balance. He simultaneously doesn't care about life, but is so overly critical of who he is as a person and what he's become. So to me, in this scene, Jake is having a conversation with an idealized notion of balance that he doesn't have with his driving instructor. Think about the occupation of this person. He's a driving instructor. So he's someone who instructs you on how to drive or to get to a certain destination. Jake is thinking of taking his own life. So to him, he has no destination, and as such, is desperately striving to find even the slightest notion of one. Next is the discourse on despair, and this is when it gets to be really disturbing and sad. So this is when he begins to justify his isolation and unhappiness. Girlfriend begins to justify why being single in all aspects of life is beautiful. There is a beauty to how committed she is to her nihilism that you almost forget that it's nihilistic at all, if that makes sense. So she begins to talk about why she wants to leave and why she wants to stay. 
in their relationship and or alive, since we know what the plot twist is. She says two things can be true at the same time. So the metaphor used for this is the story she tells about an orange plant that was painted green. If a botanist who wanted to study the plant had asked her for a green plant, she would have said no. Um, but if an artist who wanted to draw a green plant asked her for the plant, she would have happily given it to him. Take note, by occupation, Jake is a scientist, yet the idealized version of happiness from a while ago had hands of an artist. So this means that Jake's happiness or sense of being normal was just a coat of paint above him. He had to put on this coat of paint to hide the oddness that everyone would eventually see him exhibit later in life. Oddness like that of an orange plant. So she somewhat seems to accept the notion that we can only truly know ourselves in a state of solitude. And then she follows this up with a rumination on romantic relationships and how they are so hard to achieve because you actually have to go out and get one. They aren't assigned to you via biology like the relationship you have with your parents. This one is much harder to achieve. So then we finally get to hear from Jake. He shared that he got anxiety as a child, which we already theorized on some minutes ago. And he was worried about random things as a kid, worried about people in his daily life dying or abstract things like him losing a limb. So they arrive at the house of Jake's parents and we immediately notice the rotten porch in the exterior of the house seems to be quite dilapidated and decrepit. So they're walking in the barn and they see pigs being eaten by maggots. This is a visual metaphor. This is some... This is something that you wouldn't know if you only saw them from afar. Jake explains to his girlfriend that the infection that killed the pig probably started with a small cut, and then before anyone knew it, the pig died. So this to me uh, is a metaphor for how Jake's crippling depression was one that started off when he was young with a small cut, something very small and not noticeable. But many people who are smart are known to hide their depression very well. Jake is very smart, and as such, his depression probably went untreated for a long time. So they finally arrive at the house to sit down with the parents for dinner. The mom is overdressed and barefoot, and she has tinnitus and a missing nail. She also hears voices and whispers and expresses that she cannot sleep because of them. So we learn that Jake claims to have had a brother. His brother was a loner. The brother would follow him around. The brother would follow him around. His career was jeopardized because he was someone who had a phobia of others and couldn't work in a place that required interaction with other people. A condition that had gotten so bad because it's scary. So we learned that the mom, the dad, and the brother were also figments of Jake's psyche. He never had a brother, and his parents had been dead for years. We then get to the scene where the girlfriend enters the bathroom and sees a fly. The fly is unbothered when she tries to shoo it away, so she chooses to kill it fast. This conveys something very powerful. This conveys that Jake had accepted his death already, and when you shoo flies away, the fly buzzes off because it thinks you're going to kill it. So this fly has accepted its fate. The girlfriend kills it fast. This is just like how Jake has accepted his fate and has chosen to kill himself as quickly and painlessly as possible. The girlfriend hears something in the basement and she sees that the basement is accessible by a trap door that has scratches all over it. The basement is Jake's dark, fragile psyche where the girlfriend chooses to descend. In this basement, she sees a painting which has wild, heavy brush strokes. So it is a painting of the basement itself and the subject of the painting is a long-haired person with fingernails and a child next to it. So paintings and art in general are symbolic of things. So we then get into a discourse on how, as humans, we depend on symbols for meaning. We can't understand the world exclusively with rationality. We accept, reject, discern through symbols. So now, who is the person in the painting? So pause the video and tell me if you can think of a painting that has harsh brush strokes and sees a person with a child. So the one that comes to my mind is Saturn Devouring His Son by Francisco Goya. So just look at it, it's a child. So here, look at the painting. Um, it's a child, a dark room, and fingernails dugging into the child. So I'm gonna read an excerpt from, the, from a book by Fred Licht, which is an excerpt from the book Goya and the Origins of Modern Temper in Art. So at age 73, and having survived two life-threatening illnesses, likely to have been concerned with his own mortality and was increasingly embittered by the civil strife occurring in Spain. Although he initially decorated the rooms of the house with more inspiring images, in time he overpainted them all with the intensely haunting pictures known today as the black paintings. These black paintings are uncommissioned and never meant for public display. So these pictures reflect his darkening mood. So the trip to the basement is another attempt by Jake to find some meaning in life. 
But just like the subject of Goya's paintings, he is met with a face of despair. So we then learn that the, the, the trap door in the basement is locked from the inside, which seems to convey that people suffering with depression are trapped in their own dark heads. They're more likely to take their own lives if they're lonely, which is quite the running theme in this novel. So then the girlfriend makes her way into Jake's bedroom. There she ends up in a conversation with Jake's dad and he apologizes for the wife's odd behavior. The dad says he's good for you and he needs you and this is something off-putting about this. They're about to leave and the mom hands her a painting. And then she says something ominous which is open it when you arrive. The painting is a portrait of Jake. So they go to a Dairy Queen, they order drinks, and they decide they don't like the drinks and have to throw the drinks away. So Jake insists that they drive to this abandoned high school to dispose of these drinks. The girlfriend is not happy at the prospect of a sudden detour because she has a headache and wants to go home. So in the school's parking lot, they begin to kiss until Jake sees someone in the school who's watching and leering at them and he goes in after the guy. This is apparently so out of character with regard to Jake. He doesn't normally show emotions or get pissed. And then we learn that it's emotion, emotion, she likes it because Jake never shows it. This is clearly a part of himself that he misses. The ability to feel something. Okay, so then she continues more on this discourse of despair and tells herself that she is happy to be single for a long time. She says that one can't have everything. She says that this is a trade-off. She says that peace of mind does not come from relationships. It really sounds reasonable when we hear it from her, but the more you think about it, the more it just sounds like despair. So is choosing to end one's life good or bad? This book seems to be asking. So the conclusion Jake arrives at is one that suggests that it's neither. So to this man who is in despair, there seems to be no good or bad. Everything is just meaningless, and when there is no meaning, there's no morality behind one's actions. Being alive requires that you do actions, but thoughts can haunt you. And this part seems to be suggesting that the only way to achieve peace of mind alone is to take the ultimate action that ends all actions and end yourself. And hope that suffering ends with death. Like hoping that pigs can't feel the maggots devouring them. I sincerely hope they don't, the poor pigs. So eventually the narrative shifts from the girlfriend to Jake and concludes with Jake deciding to kill himself. He has no more parents, he was an only child, his debilitating fear of others ensured that he wasn't able to have any non-biological relationships. So at the end of the day, killing himself will matter to no one because he is alone. Because he doesn't have to worry about any repercussions or leaving anyone who will miss him or anyone who will have sad memories because of his death. He says, and I quote, the illness is ours alone. Think about that. So that is my analysis on the book I'm Thinking of Ending Things by Ian Reid. I sincerely cannot wait to see the Netflix film by Charlie Kaufman. But right now, I want to hear what your thoughts are. Do you think I cracked the code? Do you think I left anything out? Is there anything that you would like to add to my discussion? But as always, thank you so much for watching. Again, check the link in my bio. Let's fight the good fight together. So yeah, I hope to see you in the next video. But until then, take care. Thank you.